reggae just extra with Ras Dennis. Big Youth, the reggae veteran, says his acceptance of the Rastafari faith and sporting of dreadlocks in the early 1970s was what inspired the reggae musicians of his era like Bob Marley, Uroy, and others to start locking their hair and pinning Rasta lyrics. Big Youth's style quickly made him the most popular artist in Jamaica, where he enjoyed fame and sales that rivaled even those of his contemporary, Bob Marley. You are now watching Reggae Gist Extra's Big Youth's edition. My name is Ras Dennis, welcoming you to another video by Reggae Gist Extra. Big Youth the man who broke into the Jamaican mainstream after a number of disappointing releases is our center man for today. Kindly support our YouTube channel by subscribing, like and hit the notification bell to be the first to watch our next video. According to the Big Youth, the transitions made by the artist began sometime after he recorded his S90 Skank hit in 1972. We took a bike into the studio and create a lyrics, and I say, Right now, rhythm hold I, rhythm wild. That music was so powerful, cause dad is where me start chant ja ja wa wa wa. Is dad bring d whole rasta ting to d music, cause daddy Uroy was, pow chicka bow, chicka bow. No feelings against him, ja bless his soul, but is a spiritual message that I was telling people fee check fee ja. Nabata simmer down and bend down low, big youth said. You or Eva used to wear dreadlocks. But Big Youth come and take it up powerful that you were happy dread. Bob Marley and the Whalers were in the Soul Revolution and when Dem watched this little man as Ja Ja Wawa and flash him natty and everything and Mecca tell ya, in a year or couple months after that, everybody starts say Ras, brethren, he said. Big Youth, who is known for hits such as Screaming Target, chanting dread in a fine style and hit the road jack explained that during those days the music was centered on doing cover version of american songs and the lyrical content of the original songs of the time did not have the rastafarian spiritual influences rastafari he said came in the music when big youth come in because we have the mystic revelation of rastafari and all those people which is the same genre but a different one the music was in a state where a lot of people didn't even believe Rasta could have make it. It might interest you to know that Big Youth was born Manly Augustus Buchanan on April 19, 1949 in Trenchtown, Kingston, Jamaica. One of five children raised by his mother, a Christian preacher, and his father, a police officer, he grew up in chaos and poverty. Big Youth had a strong will and often clashed with his parents. He left school at 14, determined to make it on his own, and went to work as a diesel mechanic at the Skyline and Sheraton Hotels in Kingston. Here, he was first dubbed Big Youth because he was both younger and taller than his co-workers. After hearing him practice using his voice in the hotel's large empty rooms, his friends told him he should try to DJ. He began to work at local dance halls by night, where he developed his talent, talking and singing for an audience. By 1970, Big Youth was a regular DJ at Lord Tippertone Sound System, a popular music scene in Jamaica where dueling DJs vied for the stage. Big Youth, with his deep voice and Rastafarian style, quickly became a star. He said we had to carry a spiritual vibe within it and tell the people they must make love not war because war is ugly and love is lovely and do things right and make things bright and stop fight against one another because we thought the music wasn't getting that because romantic love alone will not change anything each of us have feelings so as long as we have romance we have that kind of love we don't have to sing about that and the world was living in selfishness like they are living today yeah it's like it's repeating history is repeating itself that's the condition the world is in right now. Although his early recordings didn't catch on with the public, he kept performing, developing a unique casual and conversational style. Finally, after releasing his eighth single, Big Youth found his audience. He had gone through some of the best-known music producers in his quest for a hit, but a young producer named Gussie Clark finally got him the recognition he deserved. 
Clark turned Big Youth's single The Killer into his first big hit. With a follow-up collaboration on the single Tippertone Rocking, the two enjoyed a back-to-back -back success that put Big Youth on the music map. His 1973 first album entitled Screaming Target, produced by Gussie Clark, is still considered as a classic of its genre, featuring rhythms from well-known hits by Gregory Isaacs, Leroy Smart, and Lloyd Parks, among others. Around this time, he also notched up some achievements in the singles chart, having seven singles in the chart at one time, and having four singles remain in the top 20 for an entire year. Throughout 1974 and 1975, he continued to record for other producers, including Glenn Brown, Double Attack, The Abyssinians, I Pray Thee, Dreader Than Dread, Yabby You, Yabby Youth, later known as Lightning Flash, Weak Heart Drop, Bunny Whaler, Bide, Black on Black, and Joe Gibbs, Medicine Doctor. His next LP, Dreadlocks Dread, was released on Click Records in 1976. Although ostensibly a big youth LP produced by Prince Tony Robinson, it in fact only featured six vocal tracks, two of which, Marcus Garvey Dread, originally Moja Garvey on Jack Ruby's Fox label, and Lightning Flash had been released as singles for other producers. You are now watching Reggae Just Extras Big Youth's Edition. When asked why he set up his own recording studio, he simply said because we put seven songs in two charts and if you saw my house down the street, it was nowhere for a human being to live. And with all that I created and having all of these guys driving nice vehicles now, come on. So, I just made a song named World is a Ghetto and I just turn around and call it Streets in Africa. When I did that, they said I can't sing. Bad minds, fight us within the business. And to be honest with all of this fame and things I create, that's the only time I saw a change that I could move out of this dilapidated building. And people were even vexed because they still wanted me to stay there to uplift them. While they want to carry you down. Cho. Then I realized and I say alright I'm not going to sing a song for no producer. When it comes to singing vocal I sing for Nagusa Nagast Big Youth. And the thing went on and on until we get a rhythm from Phil Pratt and do Every Nigger is a Star. By this time, he had begun releasing his own self-produced recordings on the Nagusa Nagast and Augustus Buchanan labels in Jamaica, sometimes buying rhythms from producers for whom he had worked, but latterly using his own musicians, usually the Soul Syndicate band. Many of his singles, such as Hot Stock and Battle of the Giants, with Uroy, were released on this imprint. His first self-produced LP was Reggae Phenomenon in 1974. His self-productions continued with Natty Cultural Dread in 1976, followed later that year by Hit the Road Jack. He covered Wake Up Everybody and What a World Needs Now also. This was helpful, as new young DJs such as Trinity and Clint Eastwood were appearing on the scene, and Big Youth's chanting style was becoming less fashionable. He signed to Virgin Records' Frontline label in 1977, his first release on the label being the Isaiah First Prophet of Old album, and he also appeared in the film Rockers, alongside Leroy Wallace, Gregory Isaacs, Jacob Miller, Dillinger, and others. Virgin declined the chance to release his next three albums, however, and as the 1970s came to a close, Big Youth's popularity took a dip. By 1982, events had combined to make reggae much less successful than it had been five years earlier. The rising tide of violence had driven many musicians and producers to leave Jamaica for the UK and US. Reggae had not broken through to widespread commercial success, and, in the wake of Bob Marley's death, a lot of major labels either dropped their Jamaican artists or spent little on promoting them, and the music returned to its insular roots. Slackness, sexually explicit lyrics, became far more fashionable than cultural Rastafari movement, and teenagers looked more towards the United States for their heroes. While his records continued to find a market, tunes like Ja Ja Golden Jubilee, Aluda Continua, and Chanting failed to capture the public imagination. The modern digital rhythms were far from suited to Big Youth's style, and his forays into the studio became less frequent. 
His appearance at Reggae Sunsplash in 1982, he would appear another four times between 1983 and 1996, was well received, but his success during the 1980s was limited. His career revived in 1990 with the chanting single produced by Winston Niney Holness and Free South Africa on the protest album One Man One Vote. In the 2000s, Big Youth teamed up with modern dub producer Twilight Circus to record two notable singles Daniel in the Lion's Den and What We Need Is Love in a style hearkening to the sound of youth's vintage 1970s classics. He received the Order of Distinction in the rank of officer on National Heroes Day for his more than four decades of contribution to the development of Jamaican music. He is now considered an elder in the reggae and Rastafarian community. He still records and performs music at his leisure. Thanks for watching and do remember to subscribe. Give it a like and post a positive comment in the comment section below and I'll see you again very soon for another video. Much effort is made to ensure all materials in Reggae Gist Extras videos fall within the guidelines of fair use. No copyright infringement is intended. If you are or represent the copyright owner of any materials accidentally used in this video and have an issue with its use, please contact me and I will respond as soon as possible. Many thanks for watching Reggae Gist Extra with Ras Dennis.